There is coming a day, is it not? That we'll have no more sorrows, no more sickness, no more pain, no more heartache, um, no more struggles of life. But while we're here on this earth, um, let us continue to look to that future, but also let us hold on tightly to what we have today and to take it and make it all it can be um, for the God's glory, for your good, for others' good. And in this, as we've been looking for this year and thinking about the idea of stand, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. You know, I was talking to someone the other day and said, you know, you don't have to manufacture love. You don't have to manufacture kindness. It's just either who you are or who you're not. And the reality is, is the more you know God, the more you're going to know love. The more you hang around God, the more you're going to be kind. It's just who you are. It's who he is. And when you hang around people, you become that kind of person. Who you hang around is who you're going to inevitably become like. So my ideal is, is that I want to hang around great godly people who are ahead of me in the faith that, that not just age-wise, but they're doing, they're being, they're living out ways that, that I haven't gotten to yet. And I, I want to hang with those kind of people to say, I want to become more like that. If you do not have someone in your life that you look up to in the faith, that you are hanging around, mimicking certain features of them to become like them, then you're doing yourself an injustice. If you are not being the mentor to someone below you that is still coming up in the faith, then you're not living the life of faith the way it should be lived. There is always someone in front of us, always someone behind us, and it is not an age factor. It is a godly factor. It is a thing that says I look and I see and I aspire to be more like you. Why? Because they are more Christ-like in that area than me. And you go, well, you're not supposed to judge. We'll do that sermon series in 2022. So wait for it. It's coming. Don't hold me to 2022. The question I have is, is do I know Jesus? When you know Jesus, it impacts your everyday life. Not know about Jesus, know Jesus. See, I know about, a little bit about every single person here. See, I know me. Some of us can't self-reflect and say, I need to grow in this area or that area. I know the areas that I need to continue to grow in and, and I don't want to be the same guy I was last year. I, I look to those people that are ahead of me and say, what would you do if you could come back and, and be where I am now? What would you do different? I, I want to know these things. Why? Because I aspire to be better tomorrow than I am today. And when I know Jesus, it changes my life because there is no name that is above his name. Jesus is the name above all names. So when I look and I aspire to be like these other Christians and do that, it is all in the understanding that they are shining the light of Jesus in and through their struggles. They're shining the light of Jesus in and through their life on a daily basis. So we can never be someone else, but there are things about them that that move us. For us today, the title I want to talk about and I want us to think about is that we're going to stand on the power of his name, Jesus, and the title is The Word. I go back to Genesis chapter 1 where it reads, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And one of the greatest semesters that I had in seminary, and according to what class I'm talking about, because I thought every one of them were, were hard. I wanted to quit. I didn't want to start. When I got into them, I was going to finish them no matter what. Uh, but I took Hebrew chapter one, I mean Hebrews, uh, uh, the first semester of Hebrews. Has anybody ever taken a semester of Hebrew? Yeah. Imagine getting strung up by your ankles and then pulling your toenails out. Yeah, it was worse than that. I mean, it was, it was not, you, it, they draw pictures for their words. That made no sense to us Americans. But for some reason, I decided to take Hebrew 2, which was not a required class. But the professor said, you'll really like it, Dr. Asa. It changed how I saw the Old Testament. And when we read Hebrew, I mean, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the, in the ancient Hebrew, when we read it, we read it just like it says up there in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when we read it in the Hebrew, there's this pause that happens. In the beginning, God. See, I don't have all the answers to what comes after. I know there's questions upon questions and people question whether or not this is one day or this is a thousand days or this is a billion years. And you know what? I don't really care. What I know is that in the beginning, God and we Paul. See, what comes after, we can debate and we can talk about. But what there is no debate about is, in the beginning, God. We need to hear this because in our life, we strive for such greatness in this life. We strive for such joy. We strive for accomplishments. And if we're not careful, those things take precedence in our life that we elevate the things of this world above God. See, when I think about Jesus and the title, The Word, I think about Genesis chapter 1. For many, whenever you think of Jesus, you don't think of Jesus until the birth of Jesus. But what I see is, is the understanding of in the beginning, God, and he created everything and his words spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light and boom, there was light. And he said, let's divide the day and the, and the night and we'll call that or the, the light and the dark and we'll call this day and we'll call this night. Boom, it happened. And he saw that it was good and everything that he put into existence was through his word. As we move into the New Testament and we look at John chapter 1, the Bible reads this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. I want you to take that last part of that verse and I want you to repeat it. The Word was God. We must understand this. We must grab this. Because as Christians today, we live in a world that somehow subdivides Jesus into this thing over here that, well, he was born, he's the son of God. We even talked about he's the son of man and we see this humanity of him. No, what we see is, is we're about to embark upon this word is Jesus. He's not a God. He's not just part of God. He is God. And when we see the Trinity and we understand, and, and I can't go into it uh, in totality, it's too much for this sermon, but we see God the Father, 
the Father, God. We see God the Son, the Son, Jesus. He's God. And God the Holy Spirit. Don't ever make the mistake of calling the Holy Spirit an it. The Holy Spirit is the living, breathing God. It is His Spirit. And when we see Him, it, He lives within all Christians. So in this, we see in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. The word. Why would you ever call word him? If we speak words, we call it them, it, they. But we don't call it him. The, the word is alive. Boy, I said that really southern like it. I even heard myself say, and I didn't have to watch it on video, live. God created everything through him. And nothing was created except through him. The word in the beginning, God he created the heavens and the earth. And John is saying, hey, in the beginning, there was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. God's words that were spoken was real life. Jesus was there. He's always been. He will always be. So when we celebrate his birth, we're celebrating one facet of eternity where he split eternity and made time for us to be able to grapple with. And he come down and he became a human. We see this. In verse 4, it reads, the word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. When we see the power of Jesus... We see him and we talk about the fact that he was born. We understand that he was born of the Virgin Mary. We, we grapple with the idea that, that he was sinless throughout his life here on earth and that he died on a cross. But we understand that before all of this earth existed, there he was. He's always been. He will always be. Ever. And in our existence today, the Bible says in John chapter 1, skipping down to verse 10, he came into the very world he created. The word. He. The word is not an inanimate object. The word is Jesus. And when you read the word, you have a conversation with God. In this word that we have before us, he came into the world. But the world didn't even recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him. Who? The word. He gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. When you hear about people saying, I'm a born again Christian, we understand that it's not about a physical rebirth. It is about a birth that says, no, I understand that the word was with God. I understand the word was God. I understand that everything that God created was created through the word. And everything that has life was created through the word. And the word, the Bible tells us, became human, became flesh. And made his home among us. He was full. And I want to repeat this word full. Of unfailing love. Grace. 
And he was full of faithfulness, truth. It's mighty difficult for any of us. In my household, uh, Heather and I, we're, we've been married for, for 22 years. I promise you, she's got more grace than I do. And I will promise you, I got more truth than she does. That doesn't mean I'm right. I'm talking about when it comes to dealing with kids, you know, Bradley probably doesn't remember this, but some six years ago, he and I were the only ones home, but he didn't know it. And he had been outside and he was playing and he comes inside. I'm sitting down in the living room. And he comes inside going, <laughs> I miss my mama. I miss my mama. I said, what'd you do? He said, I hurt myself. I, hurt myself. I said, are you bleeding? <laughs> no, no. Where's mama? And I said, she's not home. He goes, oh. All right. And he stood up immediately and walked out. Like he knew I was going to be the truth and mama's going to be the grace. Like, oh, come here to mama. Mama, take care of you. And then daddy doesn't do that stuff. Not like that. The reality is, is Jesus, the word is both. He is the truth in your life when you need to hear truth that says you're wrong, you're not doing things right. You need to take heed to the counsel that I'm giving you. But he's also that grace that says, hear my unfailing love that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how you've lived your life, come into the arms of the Word. The one who was there in the beginning, who's always been, Bible says, and we have seen his glory. Who? The word. Jesus in the flesh. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. I want us to think for a moment what the psalmist wrote when we think about the word. When we think about in the beginning and we grapple with this idea of how is Jesus born how is Jesus here? And now we see a, a, a finite being here in this, in this sense of he's got a start date. He has an end date. That's how we all work. That's how it always works. But if you was to look at his grave, which he is no longer there, he ascended up into heaven. He didn't die the second time. He died once for all. And what we see is, is that he descended so that he could ascend back up to the place we will Die and then ascend. See, we're finite people with eternity on the other side. He's always been eternal. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 33. Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre. Make music for him uh, on the ten string harp, sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true. And we can trust everything he does. He loves whatever is just and good, the unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans and vast reservoirs let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, I want us to hear this speaking being the word. And the word was with God. The word was God. And the very nature of who we see in
in Jesus Christ becoming a human being is the fullness of God. When we see Jesus, when we read about Jesus, we see all the attributes, all the characteristics of God. Why? Because he's God. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. We go to verse 18 and it reads, But the Lord watches those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing Love. God watches over you. He watches over me. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation of life that hits us, we understand that his unfailing love, his grace is found in and through Jesus, who is the word and the word is God. God has always been. He will always be. And in this very moment, who you hang around is who you will become like. Don't make the mistake of thinking, no, I'm going to hang around somebody toxic and I'm going to make them better. Let's be honest about it. If you can't control an Oreo cookie calling out to you, you can't control what another human being does. I had to make that determination on my own. Because for some reason, people think I like Oreo cookies and they'll just show up on my desk. And I'll be sitting there going, no, today I'm starting a new diet where I don't eat anything wrong. And I show up and there's a double stuffed Oreo sitting on the thing going, yeah. If Oreos can control you, what makes you think you're going to control somebody else? Who you hang around is who you're going to become like. So I look at this and I say, wait a minute. God is going to watch over me. The living, breathing word. God became flesh. He became human. And he brought with him unfailing love. But he brought with him truth says that the Lord watches over us. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. There are some of us today that are putting our hope in people. Stop putting your hope in people. It doesn't mean we don't have friends. It doesn't mean we don't help people. It doesn't mean we don't strive to live after. But I'm telling you right now, there are marriages right now today failing because we have too high of an expectation of what our spouse is supposed to be and what they're supposed to do. They are not God. They will never be God. They cannot be God. If I'm putting all of my hope in Heather, it will ultimately fail. If Heather puts all of her hope in me, it will ultimately fail because I am a mere human being. I am not God. She isn't either. So if I'm not hanging around with the living, breathing word of God who was in the beginning, who's always been, he will always be. If I'm not hanging around him, then I'm going to give her less than in my relationship. The psalmist finishes up and says, In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Do you want the unfailing love of God to surround you? Do you want to find that relationship with the word that's always been? Do you really want that relationship with Jesus that goes beyond book smart, that goes beyond just, yeah, I believe, but that it moves you to action. 
See, what comes to mind when you see this? Joy, blessing, desire to open it up, or work, shame. Oh, if I have to, I'll open it up. A chore. For many, you haven't opened up the word of God in a long time because you use this phrase. It's difficult to understand. And I'll give it to you. There's a lot that is difficult. But if you focus on the things you do understand and quit harping on the things you don't understand, I promise you there's enough about God's word that will fill you up like you never thought was possible. But there's a problem we live in. When our devices become our vices, we miss out on the blessings of God's word. When the devices, you know, our phones, our TV, internet, whatever it is that you fill in the blank with, we, we have all kinds of things that, that become vices in our life that on itself are not intrinsically bad, but all of a sudden what we see is, is we have no time for the blessings of God's word. We have no time for Jesus. We have no time for his spirit. The reality is, is that the Bible tells us all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, scripture, the word, Jesus, God. To prepare and equip his people to do every good work. What comes to mind when you see the Bible? Are you ready or are you prepared to take the devices of your life, whatever it is, and say, I need to set some time aside and get unplugged from that lifestyle? That thing that keeps drawing me over and over again. That if I go throughout my day and I haven't looked it up yet or I haven't picked it up, that I would find myself getting the jitters because I got to have it. When's the last time you got the jitters? Because you hadn't read God's word in a few days. Are you willing to unplug 15 minutes a day to hang out with Jesus? And you say, yeah, but if I talk, I don't know if he hears me. You know what? Maybe it's time we stop talking so much. Maybe in our prayer lives, we spend more time talking and we don't ever slow down to listen. God has given us an avenue to let him speak to us. So I offer you this, a 40 day challenge. I spoke with someone uh, through message this past week and you know, as I was preparing for this sermon and it just hit me and, and I gave them a response. I'm gonna go back to a verse in John chapter one. And it reads, but all who believed in him, the word, Jesus, God in the flesh from the very beginning, but all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So I read to you my response and I give this out to you because I again ask, are you willing to take a 40 day challenge? Trying to find our identity in life is tough. As we become teenagers, it's even tougher. And then, of course, as adults, it becomes unbearable. Many people never truly capture the reality of what real identity means. It is not how I compare to others. It's not even how I compare to God. 
Our identity is not what I think I am, and it certainly isn't what you think I am. It's not what others think I am, and it's not what I think I am. For the Bible says my identity is based on what God says I am. And the Bible says that if I believe that he accepts me and I become his child, it's okay to strive for better things in this life. It's okay to, to strive for better things and better people to be around you. But in the end, what have you gained? Something that won't matter in a few days, a few weeks, a few years. The Bible is filled with stories and verses that tell us we are his child. However, it is for you to decide what to do with that information that will turn the tide of your life. It will turn the tide of your emotions. It will turn the tide of your self-worth. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a 40-day challenge with me starting today. And I want you to read Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. You know, I see everybody going for their pencils and papers and putting it in their phones so quickly because they want to take this challenge. And then others are sitting there going, I don't know. You got to write it down if you're going to do it. And I can see everybody. I know y'all think I can't see. This is not something that I do lightly. This is something that I have done probably five times uh, over the last 10 years at different times of my life. This is something that started in seminary with one class uh, of, I think there were three of us in that class, maybe two. Uh, and we did it in that, for that whole semester. It wasn't 40 days, it was for the whole semester. And every day we read these verses. And this is what we do. After reading those 17 verses each day, pick out one verse or one phrase in that verse that sticks out most to you. Explain out loud why that verse, why that phrase is speaking to you right then. And then pray that God will give you the strength to move forward, trusting his purpose and his plan for your life. So what we do is we take and we look at Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 17 and we read them every day. And as you read through, there's going to be something in there, a phrase, there's going to be a verse that's going to poke at you. And it doesn't matter if it's a harsh phrase or if it's just a, a good, hey, I feel blessed phrase. It don't matter if you feel blessed that day, take it. Go with it. Spend 15 minutes with God saying, I want to read your word. Why? Because when I read your word, I talk to Jesus. And let's be honest about it. We need to spend more time listening to Jesus than we need to spend speaking at Jesus. Jesus is the greatest influence in the entire history of mankind. For in the beginning, God, and he spoke these things into existence. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word has always been there with God, and he is God, and he became human, and it's Jesus that we see him, and he's full of unfailing love and truth. Take the truth of his word today. And take this challenge seriously. So as we stand and, and you guys come up to, to sing this song and this altar is, is always open uh, any time in the service. To come and pray and be with the Lord. To give him whatever it is. Lord, I ask you that as we stand here, that as whatever song is getting ready to be sung, if, if we haven't accepted this challenge into our life, this moment, that, that we get to know Jesus.
I've given them specific verses, but Lord, if there's another set of verses, it, it, it's your word. I want us to just get involved in your word. My identity is not in what I think of myself. My self-worth is not based upon what somebody else says about me. My identity is as a child of God. And as a child of God, Lord, I want to learn from you. Help me take this seriously, Lord. Lord, when I see your holy word that, that I would find myself maybe even someone going, I don't know what version to use, Lord, let them find a version that helps them to read the English words that make sense to them. Because, Lord, I just want us to have conversations with you. The one who has existed from forever. Lord, surround us with your unfailing love. As we read your word and talk to you about it. It's in Jesus' name we pray.